So to continue my um, thoughts about the Scottish independence referendum from a philosophical and spiritual perspective, I'd like to just continue by saying that whilst many people reject the theistic god of traditional revealed religions, um, and one can understand why, because human experience is now so much more complex than in the days of Abraham and Moses and Muhammad and Jesus. We live in a world of interconnectedness, of um, transpersonal unity, of access to the sum total of human um, reflection and thought and, and scientific endeavours over the millennia. We live in a far more complex world than um, the early monotheist traditions would, would have us believe. But nevertheless, many people still want to retain some kind of belief in the, in the divine, some kind of belief in transpersonal wisdom, a source of um, all that is, a source of the universe. And rather than having a big bang just come out of nowhere in the secular cosmology of uh, modern, in a sense, pseudo-scientific speculation, um, some people would, would like to say, well, this Big Bang must have come from somewhere. There must be some kind of divine intelligence or, or source or creator um, which has made it all possible. And we, obviously, it's beyond human intelligence at the current state of play to fully understand that. We're, we're as it were, like children just learning to walk intellectually. But nevertheless, one can have faith, and this was Kant's point. Where the intellect can't work it out, then faith kicks in. And I would say there is a, there is a, meta, there is a parallel here. The intellect can tell us, I mean, I've gone into this in great detail using my intellectual capacities as much as possible, and I, as far as I can work out, the idea of splitting up the UK is going to be a bad idea for all the reasons I've enunciated, and also all those that I can't have time to share. My intellect tells me it's probably a bad idea, but my faith then, but, but obviously I can't know for sure, none of us can know, but then my faith aspect, my spiritual <coughs> nature then kicks in and says, yes, not only that, but I also feel instinctively it's a bad idea. Um, I, I, you know, I, I took an oath of loyalty to the United Kingdom when I was working as a nursing orderly back in Canada, nursing veteran soldiers. Um, actually to the to the queen in fact and to keep confidential what i learned in that job nursing old soldiers from both world war one and world war two and this i'm recording this on the anniversary of the outbreak of world war one on august the fourth <clears throat> and exactly a hundred years ago our country went to war a horrendous war should never have happened uh, many scottish canadians died and Many of them were still in, like, shell shock when I was nursing them. <clears throat> what we have to ask is, what would be the most conducive to peace? What's the most likely to, to keep us away from ever recurring and revisiting that, that, those horrors? Um, <clears throat> is it to break up the United Kingdom and to have separate nation states emerging? Uh, or is it to stay together, but then to develop a coherent integral peace policy? for our country as a whole to have a kind of conversion experience and to realize that peace is the absolutely central moral um, duty of us as, as, as citizens. And I would say that as a culture which is normally Christian, we have a, a crown monarch, we have a tradition of Christianity in our country going right back to the very earliest times. <clears throat> and before that we have a interesting and profound Druid tradition um, which we can glean and understand from the ancient Bardic traditions that have come down in Welsh and Gaelic um, and Britonic sources, and which come up in the Arthurian traditions of Merlin and so on. If we look at all that, we can see that, well, actually, yes, they are also saying peace is the prior duty of mankind. <clears throat> That's the whole purpose of the wisdom teachings. So, but peace and unity, the idea of the round table, the Arthurian tradition is about keeping everybody has a seat at the table and it's a round table so I think the same with the whole of uh, the kingdom of the saints the kingdom of, of 
of people united in spirit, which is what I think the phrase the United Kingdom really should mean. We should be integral, enlightened saints, so to speak, in this country. It's, it's a marvellous country with tremendous resources to draw on. And, as I've said, to, to, to reduce it to a kind of balkanization would be to diminish and demean what this country stands for. <clears throat> Um, but we do need to be more proactive in projecting that peace message into the world and assisting and helping countries that are flailing and falling apart and experiencing civil wars. The last thing we ought to be doing is to have a civil war ourselves of ideas and, and legalistic jargon, which is what we've been having for the past several years. I'm hoping this referendum will put that behind us finally and we can, we can then build a truly united kingdom which stands for peace, and we can make a pledge as a country as a whole to get rid of our nuclear weapons, and to assist and help and hope that the rest of the world, Russia, America, China, can also join with us, and Israel, and Pakistan, and India. And we can get some kind of international order replacing the chaos that we've got at the moment. And the Commonwealth can play an important role in that, as I proposed in the admission of Palestine into that community of nations. So there's a different theory of, of the future. Now, in a sense, I was talking about the goddess traditions. <clears throat> I think the goddess, at her best, stands for Sophia, wisdom. <clears throat> and in the Judeo-Christian Islamic cultures uh, of you know, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, there is this understanding that, that Holy Sophia, or wisdom, is indeed what inspires the great statesmen, the great scholars, the great sages, and to be a devotee of wisdom, or Sophia, is, is the highest calling we humans can attain. Now, there have been many people in our culture, in, in the United Kingdom's history, and indeed the people who patched us together, um, people like Francis Bacon and King James I, or King James VI, his son, Prince Henry, who was destined to become a great Renaissance prince, but unfortunately died after swimming in the Thames, caught typhoid. But my own daughter went to a school named the Prince Henry School in Evesham, which was set up by his tutor. Sir Roy Strong wrote a book called England's Lost Renaissance about Prince Henry. There have been a whole succession of Renaissance thinkers, of geniuses, and Shakespeare's one, Sir Isaac Newton is one, uh, Darwin in his own way, and A.R. Wallace, the whole 19th century naturalist, Lord Kelvin, the physicist. I mean, if you, if you look at the um, enlightened thinkers who've, who've, who've peopled the galaxy of British history over the last 400 years since the union of the two crowns, um, I think we can stand with any nation proudly and say, well, you know, we've been helping to try and advance human well-being through knowledge through science, through learning, through scholarship, through the arts, through poetry, through music, and so on. Um, and we need to continue doing that, and not waste our time by, by reverting to a kind of legalistic nationalist debate about, about brooding Balkanism. Um, and the goddess of wisdom, the goddess Sophia, I think over, overshadows this country. It's interesting that Britannia is depicted as a goddess, and I think that, that, you know, that's a good metaphor, a good model for us to follow. Um, women throughout the United Kingdom who, who bear the pains of childbirth and, and child-rearing um, are really the backbone of our nation, and I don't think it's in their interests, and I'm speaking as a man here, to see our country split up into kind of balkanized um, republics, so to speak. And... Britannia should stay together. The goddess shouldn't um, be, be broken up. But she should don her peace clothes. And there's, there's much that the, the, this debate and this referendum, I think, has taught the British people that it is time to get rid of our nuclear weapons. It's time to develop a peace policy. It's time to develop a politics that is, that is inclusive and caring, that takes the poor, the elderly, the sick, the old, um, with it, and it's not so much a welfare state we need as a caring state. We need to rethink and somehow remarry the, 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 the idealism of socialism with the realism of conservatism. 
And as a philosopher, maybe there are ways I can suggest that can be done. Drawing on the best aspects of those uh, trains of thought. <clears throat> now, from the perspective then of economic philosophy, I think I've said that I think the evidence, the bulk of the evidence, shows that the United Kingdom as a whole will be better off if we stay together. I think all the evidence that's come in shows there'd be a huge cost of separation, and the cost of living would rise particularly in Scotland. But it would also probably rise in the whole United Kingdom. Um, it would be an absolute nightmare of legalism and wrangling and civil servants paying each other an awful lot of money to produce report after report after report, none of which actually generates any wealth for anybody apart from themselves. The bureaucrats, the civil servants and the political classes, the politicians, would just have a field day. And this is what I think, as a philosopher, is wrong about the current proposal. And if you look at all the key players, they are from those classes and have no... I, I, I think you know, have no real understanding that their proposals are going to damage the ordinary working people of Britain <clears throat> throughout the country, including, above all, in Scotland. And by dressing it up in the rhetoric of Scottish nationalism, it's as if it's a sweetener on a poison pill which makes people buy it. It's kind of heroin disguised as candy. And I think this is very dangerous and also um, actually self-destructive. And so, you know, I think, I think it needs exposing and, and analysing. And um, I've written quite a lot about philosophy and economics. I'm interested in moral philosophy and ethics. And, and I think the f absolute first duty in, in, in any kind of academic work is truth-telling. And um, I think the friends that know me have, have heard me say that the very first bill that I think should be published in, in the Scottish and British parliaments and the Welsh is that all politicians should tell the truth in any official business. And if they're found to have lied or deceived, they should immediately lose office. We need a truth-telling bill. And I think probably half the MPs and, and MSPs would, would probably just have to resign. Um, let's get some truth here. And, and I think that should be legislated. Uh, Zach Goldsmith is trying to get MPs recalled if they've if they've committed crimes and so on, um, and to give people the right of recall, which is fine. But I think this, this business about truth-telling is the absolute centre of that. One can have different views, but facts are facts. So, from the sort of legal philosophy then, um, again, my concern is with the whole legalistic nightmare that would be produced if, if, our, if, if Scotland becomes an independent country and severs from the UK, a marriage that's lasted 400 odd years cannot be so easily disentangled. And I believe JK Rowling spoke out about this, and this is one of the reasons she came out strongly on the side of keeping the country together, which is a position I, I've come around to supporting as well. <clears throat> um, I don't like the way that lawyers um, make everything so complicated. They write incredibly complex contracts, which only they can understand. They charge hundreds of pounds an hour just to decipher language that they themselves have created. And the reams of paperwork that have already been generated by this um, proposal for divorcing a country which has remained the same for 400 years is an absolute nightmare. Um, and it will continue, it will continue for decades to come as every little last detail of, of the internal fabric of our country would need to be sorted out. What would happen to all people of English descent who live in Scotland or the people of Scottish descent who live in England? They presumably have to choose citizenship, they'd choose a passport. Would they have right of abode? Would they have right of residency? What if they intermarry? You know, all the kind of nightmare that happened in the Balkanisation of the breakup of Yugoslavia would begin to kick in. Of course, it wouldn't immediately kick in. And, you know, the heroin on the pill, the, sorry, the, the, the candy on the heroin makes it taste sweet, uh, you know, as, a, as an idea at the beginning. But once, I, I can assure you, in Yugoslavia, once it began to dawn on people that actually they were now in totally separate countries, a whole emotional reaction then kicks in. And, and then people's passions get get risen into the equation. And before you know it, you know, there are snipers on the streets of Sarajevo. 
And I had friends that escaped from Sarajevo, and I sheltered them in my house in Islington for a while. And they told me, with tears in their eyes, Thomas, you must be very careful, this never happens here in the United Kingdom. And this was in about 1989, 1990. I said to them, um, you know, Nenad, it could never happen here. We're far too civilized. We will never do a Balkanization. We'll never do a Yugoslavia breakup thing. And that's really why I'm speaking out now. Just, to, you know, we're, we're, we're coming close to it. And that's my concern. And my wish to, to prevent that tragedy recurring on my own backyard. From the perspective of political philosophy, I've talked a lot about um, different aspects of politics in, in this in this uh, series of talks. Um, the big political theories, I mean, from a socialist perspective, um, the UK has been a pioneer of, of a democratic and moderate socialism, the Fabian tradition, parliamentary route to socialism, and, and the sharing of communal uh, resources in, in the interests of, of, of all of us. Um, I think that's that's a good tradition and Robert Owen the great Welsh pioneer from Welshpool where I used to live um, came up to Scotland and, and founded the new Lanark mills to try and improve the conditions of working people and he founded the cooperative movement to increase the the well-being of, of, of everybody so that we all benefit from the industrial revolution he was a pioneer of socialism but he was also a spiritualist and a man who believed firmly in the metaphysical dimensions of existence, as did some of the founders of the Fabian Society. Frank Podmore and others were involved with the Society for Cycle Research. And that side of socialism, which was also written about Saint-Simon, was utterly obscured and neglected by the Marxist misinterpretation of, of the socialist uh, project. When people reduce uh, human beings to mere economic consumers, producers, and and hoarders, then I think it diminishes the image of, of, of God inside us all, or the image of the goddess, or the Buddha nature, or the Tao nature, I don't care what you call it, there's something ineffable and divine within us, this is my belief, and it's been the b belief of the bulk of philosophers, theologians, people in the United Kingdom and in Britain and Ireland, since the dawn of time, so far as we can know, I'm speaking here from the the main perspective of the heritage of these islands, but also throughout Europe, um, throughout the tradition of both the pagan pre-Christian cultures and, and then the Christian cultures that, that were built on those foundations, the very first theologians affirmed the wisdom of the pagans and said, yes, that spiritual wisdom they had, people like Clement um, of Alexandria and Origen and um, in, in Britain many great sages um, who wrote about these things. Um, in Scotland, Duns Scotus, who was probably the most learned of the theologians uh, who ever came from here, um, they all affirmed the spiritual dimension. So I want a politics that, that gives, gives freedom to people to fully develop their own capacities and, and potential, to become citizens of the kingdom of love, to develop their skills, their aptitudes, their knowledge through education and and through training and so on. Um, many of the ideals that I think the Scottish Nationalists have, have stood for and proposed, such as keeping university education free and so on, are, are noble and should really be adopted elsewhere in the country. I think the, the way that students are charged and get into debt to study, I think, is wrong. And we should go back to the grant system we always used to have, uh, right up until the 80s, and, and the Thatcherite, um, you know, destruction of, of that. The other traditions of politics, though, liberalism and conservatism, are important too. And quite a lot of the Scottish nationalist kind of groundswell is, is quite anti-Tory. It's, it's like an anti-conservative movement, actually, in which the conservatives are seen as English, Cameron and so on and and to be a true patriot you have to therefore oppose England and oppose the Conservatives this I think with all due respect is a distortion of history the Conservative movement was a reaction to the excesses of the French Revolution and was spearheaded by many people throughout the whole of the British Isles who were appalled at the 
political excesses of revolutionary nationalism and Edmund Burke and many other um, thinkers um, who, who, who took the view that actually what we need is a gradualist path towards moral reformation and political reformation hand in hand. Authentic liberalism was never about putches and, and coups and, and legislating freedom at the end of a bayonet as in the, the revolutionary tradition. And the British people took a different mode. Um, and the Scots were absolutely the centre of that. Um, Burns himself wrote against, against the French revolutionary um, enthusiasms. Uh, Thomas Carlyle wrote against the... Uh, well, actually wrote a huge history of the French revolution, go really into detail on, on what kinds of excesses were committed in the name of revolutionary nationalism. And Sir Walter Scott was one of the key figures also in the rise of a kind of conservative reaction against that. And with um, the people throughout Europe, there was a revulsion against that revolutionary nationalism. There was a small revolutionary attempt in Glasgow in the 1820s to actually have literally a Scottish revolution. Um, but it was actually, it didn't come to anything. And it never succeeded, but, but some people were inspired by the French revolutionaries to attempt an armed coup. Um, and, but on the whole, the majority of people in Britain said, no, if we go down that route, we end up effectively with a reign of continual terror, because one faction comes into power and then kills off the next faction, the earliest faction, and then the next comes in, and so on and so on. It's a continual rot rotating guillotine. And it need not now be, um, well, I mean, that is what unfortunately goes on in countries where <clears throat> that revolutionary tradition becomes the rhetorical centre of politics. Now, <coughs> in Britain, I think, we, we fortunately avoided all that. We went for a moderate path. And in fact, it was the Conservative Party under Disraeli and and others that legislated a lot of the progressive um, legislation that, that Britain benefits from. In fact, it was the Tory party that gave women the vote, finally, in, in, in Britain, and that made a lot of um, uh, progressive um, possibilities um, for, for the people of Britain. So the kind of rhetoric of anti-conservatism um, is actually premised, it seems to me, on quite a lot of ignorance. And um, as someone who's lived and worked throughout the whole United Kingdom, I've met people f representing all political parties and persuasions. I've known people active in the Labour Party, in the Green Party, in the Liberal Democrats, in the old Liberal Party, the SDP and the Conservative Party. And on the whole I find, that, find many of them to be people of integrity and, and, and truth speaking. What I do think is that the notion of breaking up the, the chessboard, so to say, by splitting up the country into different uh, different states is taking the whole equation into a, into a, uh, a different ball game and um, introducing a whole um, dimension of disruption which is non-conducive to the real concentration on the work that we should be doing, which as I say I think is peace, is social justice, is wisdom, is education, is creating a climate of concern and compassion in society, encouraging people to, to, to think for themselves and act for themselves, to develop their own businesses, their own entrepreneurial skills, um, and to free up the red tape and, and state control that, in a sense, makes it less worthwhile to go and get a job than to live on benefits. All these things, I mean, I've proposed that there should be like a citizen's wage and if you create a business or, a, or, or develop a self-employment project, you would get more than the citizen's wage, which would be equivalent to the, the unemployment thing. And you'd, you'd, you'd get that for a sufficient time to get your business up and running. In other words, we'd be encouraging people to work rather than encouraging them to do nothing. So, but these, these are things that could be done nationally. There's enough wealth in the country as a whole to develop those kind of schemes. There isn't if we start splitting up. That's my, that's my belief. 
and my concern. Um, I've talked about from the perspective also green politics. I think there are huge environmental problems that need tackling. And again, they need to be tackled as a country as a whole. Britain is not a large island, and with Northern Ireland and, and um, the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man and so on, we, we share the same ecosystem. I've actually called for a Council of the Isles to have a, an eco dimension. We should be looking at ways of sustaining our energy base without having to do fracking and, and potentially dangerous uh, developments. And here I think we should be developing new energy sources and galvanizing the great minds of our uh, academic and scientific um, expertise. In Japan, they have a thing called the Ministry of um, Industrial and Technological Innovation, MITI, which really was responsible for the Japanese economic miracle, because what they did is they worked with industry companies like Sony to create the most advanced um, gadgets in the world and to sell them throughout the world. And it was, it was led by MITI. What the United Kingdom needs is an equivalent, a kind of MITI, where it goes out and headhunts and works with the cleverest scientists, engineers and technologists in the country, whether they're in a Scottish, an English, a Welsh or an Irish university. And then it, it says, well, what we want you to do is go out there and create a camera that works underwater or go out there and create a, um, you know, something that takes away midges, uh, which is the curse of West Scotland. Or we want you to develop uh, an energy source that doesn't uh, pollute and doesn't block the landscape with huge windmills and so on, but somehow taps into gravity. And we want you to create a car that doesn't burn up oil but works on a totally different system and we want you to create um, high-tech solar panels that actually just work with daylight don't need direct sunlight and so on and so on and so on you know I think this is possible our country has the brains to do that and we should get on with it and we should tackle these problems on a nationwide basis this is the point of the global green university for example and in order to develop a true peace policy in the world, we have to tackle the problems of resource scarcity and shortage. But only if we work together um, will we be able to do that. And that's why I think the UK can contribute for the betterment of the world to a, to a, to a, new, a new scientific and technological revolution, so to speak, which is a green one and which doesn't um, depend on scarce resources. From the perspective of um, also an anarchist perspective, which is, which is another political philosophy that, that I've studied and that's interesting, I think we need fewer government uh, regulatory bodies. We need less government, not more. I'm with Gandhi, I'm with Thoreau, I'm with, I think, Christ, when he said what we need is the kingdom of God and not you know, the kingdom of Caesar. Um, we need a, a kingdom that, in which individual moral conscience is empowered rather than state bureaucracies and, and uh, you know, nitpicking council people that come and declare this, that or the other project illegal, as we're seeing at the moment. People building their own eco-homes and so on have to pass through all these ridiculous hoops to, to be able to do that. We should be freeing up people to, to explore and innovate and develop businesses and to develop their, their homes for their children um, you know, things like canoe businesses or whatever. There's so much land in the UK that isn't being developed. I worked with Robert Hart, who had this idea of forest gardening. There's large parts of Scotland that could be um, developed in this way, and large parts of other other parts of the United Kingdom, in which in which we can encourage people to develop eco homes, eco villages, to live close to nature, but with all the advantages of advanced communications and engineering technology as well. And Findhorn is one of the pioneers of that kind of vision. Um, but there are many other such communities throughout the United Kingdom. Now, now people from who are on the frontier of, of green thinking and, and this kind of eco-anarchist thinking should be encouraged, in my view, by government to be getting on with this. And this is the idea of freeing up planning law not everybody needs to live in a hugely expensive little box made of bricks with 
with all the right um, European Union um, approved bits of wire hidden in, in, in particular ways, what we should be able to do is, is, is develop, as it were, quirky homes <coughs> in a way that work. And as Rudolf Steiner said, that have more curves that are more friendly to the psyche. Um, but I think this is, a, this is a national issue. I know people in Cornwall, in Wales, in, in Suffolk, in, in Yorkshire, in, in you know, different parts of Scotland, in Northern Ireland, who want to live in a more eco-friendly way, who want to live with the state off their backs. And I think a good government, a good state, governs very lightly and, and has little regulatory interest. It, 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 the best government, as it says in the Tower Scripture, one of the wisest scriptures on the planet, is that which has to govern least because people govern themselves. Now I don't see that kind of attitude actually coming from the Scottish National Party and I don't see their proposal for a new state of Scotland which they would of course hope to run till the cows come home and we'd have soon a President Salmon running the whole thing. I don't see that as a light touch um, eco-friendly, um, you know, <clears throat> empowerment kind of state. I see it from what I can tell, my encounters with Scottish officialdom, as a dead hand bureaucratic paper producing nightmare. <coughs> I've never had such trouble in my life as with elements of the Scottish government bureaucracy. So the signs are absolutely nightmarish. I don't know if other people can 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 also confirm this. I know the rhetoric is, is very eco-friendly and very, um, you know, full of, full of the jargon of empowerment, but actually the reality has been the complete opposite <clears throat> in my experience. And so I'm extremely suspicious of, of false rhetoric. And the proof is in the pudding. Um, rather than therefore creating a whole new uh, state bureaucracy and government bureaucracy from scratch in which in which which would attract bureaucrats like like you know you wouldn't believe the exactly the wrong kind of people that we don't want running our lives would then be attracted to 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 then into positions of power to then control how we should work and live and by introducing nationalism as the kind of criterion of authenticity politically of course nobody will be safe because everybody is 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 a mixture of, of of identities. Everybody, as I've argued in this series of talks, is a complex, multi-dimensional being. And our true loyalty should be, as I keep saying, to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the goddess, to a higher order of reality. So to reduce us to political ciphers you have to ascribe to a particular kind of nationalism, to me, sets the clock back at least 400 years. Um, and And when we commiserate on this day the outbreak of World War One, the tragedy of all that, that was caused by this, this, this nationalist furore. We certainly don't want to go back there. And um, one of the founders of the Scottish nationalist movement, Lewis Spence, wrote about this, the occult causes of, of World War One. His antidote was, was to develop Scottish nationalism. He thought that the war was obviously a tragedy but I believe his analysis was false, and although I respect some of his work as a, as a seer and as a druid, um, he also got some things wrong, and in my opinion, his development of Scottish nationalism was premised on certain, certain outmoded concepts. Also in his spirituality, he was someone that believed, for example, Atlantis was an actual place that existed, um, and he had um, a, a, a different emphasis in his occult beliefs to my own um, and I would I can only say they were somewhat non-rational um, if not anti-rational this is where we differ I'm with Ken Wilber I believe in a rational kind of mysticism truly integral transpersonal theory is about uniting the best of our rational heritage our enlightenment heritage with the best of our mystical and esoteric heritage we don't want to turn the clock back to the to the kind of mentality that, that was there before we even attained rationalism and, and, and logic. And I think my, my analysis of Lewis Spence is that he was actually trying to do that in his own romantic occultism. And, and really that was the kickstart of the whole Scottish nationalist movement. 
uh, it was a retrogressive kind of uh, melange. But Lewis Spencer's in, 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 uh, contribution was very important, and I think fundamentally flawed for the reasons I've I've been giving. Now, if we look, I've I've already talked quite a lot about ethics, but I want to just finish this talk with a with a summary. A, a romp through some of the different schools of ethics. Now, I've talked from the Kantian perspective enough. Uh, I was trained by a Scottish Kantian philosopher at the University of Bristol. I worked with Professor Stephen Corner. Kant's one of the great philosophers of our era. Now, he was himself part Scottish. Not many people realise that. Um, he, he was proud of his Scottish heritage, and he lived in Konigsberg. He, he was interested in the cosmopolitan or universal heritage of the Enlightenment. He was influenced by Hume, who was another great Enlightenment thinker. And although Kant dis di di disagreed with Hume in the end, um, he, he respected his right to question and his scepticism. In my own studies of Hume, I also feel that his scepticism wasn't, in a sense, taken far enough. He never became sceptical enough of his own scepticism. There's a point at which one has to transcend one's own scepticism and leap back into a kind of faith, an affirmation of existence. Being can't exist without something being there to support it all. And this was Kant's point, that underlying everything, there's a divine order. The ethical argument for the existence of God is the only one that Kant finally, ultimately, approved of. <clears throat> and I think that from that there flows the, the ought. Without that, everything is a maybe. It doesn't matter, everything's ethically relative, you can vote this way, you can vote that way, you can do whatever you want. No, somewhere there's, there's, there's a kind of ought as opposed to just, well, whatever. And I think we're facing such an ought here in this, in this choice. It's extremely difficult, and I, as I say, I respect deeply people that will be voting the other way, and if the majority of people vote that way, obviously, you know, that, that's, that's the fair result. But I personally, for reasons I've given, I think the Kantian perspective shows that, that if you apply the categorical imperative test, then the great happiness of, of, of the people of Britain, and internationally, will be served by choosing to stay together. To me, it's a question of choosing an integral love, rather than a divisive love. Um, you know, the, the British people as a whole, the Welsh, the Scots, the Irish, the English, in all their shades and colours, and so many of us now from, from uh, born abroad, like me. I'm, I'm Canadian, uh, you know, traditionally, but I've chose to live here for most of my life, and I love this country, but I love all of it. So from a Kantian perspective, I think, I think it would be basically, let's keep this country together. From a utilitarian perspective, associated with Bentham and J.S. Mill <clears throat> and others, there's the idea of the greatest happiness principle. The ethical choice is the one that would lead to the greatest happiness. And again, I think from a utilitarian angle, to keep the country together <coughs> is going to cause the greatest happiness for the, for the most people in the island as a whole. And also in Scotland itself. Because I think that the outcome of, of independence would be increased turbulence, economic problems in Scotland, but also in the country as a whole. Um, the only classes that would really benefit would be the political classes, the bureaucrats, the civil servants and the lawyers. And the vast majority of people would become poorer and less content. There would be restrictions on movement and there'd be a huge uncertainty about Britain's future in Europe, and European politicians would no doubt get interfering, and there'd be argy-bargy, you know, <laughs> for decades to come. And this doesn't, isn't conducive to happiness. The agenda I'm trying to sketch out, whereby we stay together, but seriously focus on the real problems affecting us and the world, like seriously develop a peace policy in this country, seriously solve the problems of resource scarcity, seriously solve the problems of energy and, and, and create some new scientific discoveries that can break through, seriously tackle the problems of poverty and, and, and generate enough wealth that everybody can, can live at a comfortable living and, and so on. These enormous problems, um, solving those by combining the best minds of, of the whole of the UK 
would create the best happiness and from a utilitarian perspective I think therefore should be should be voted for um, another field of ethics is utilitarian uh, sorry is situation ethics which argues that you can't make general rules one of the problems with other ethical systems says Joseph Fletcher its founder is that you know life life is complex and situations change and what you have to do therefore is is not have a rule bound ethics but rather one that's flexible and 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 open to to the nuances of time as it shifts and i think that from a situational perspective the choice facing us over over whether to break up the uk and create this this these decades of legal wrangling and unpleasantness or or to stay together and muddle through and solve our problems collectively it seems to me fairly obvious that that it would be better to stay together and solve these problems otherwise it's a bit like let me put it like this let's say there's a racetrack formula one uh, driving team and they've been they've been competing together for centuries um, you know they're doing quite well but they're not necessarily they're always in the top five but they're not actually winning uh, you know at the moment there's some other big teams on the block and some members of the team are saying well maybe we, what we should do is break up this team and we'll go off and develop our own car and, and we'll compete but actually you know this we, we're coming up to the World Cup and and there's a huge um, pressure on 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 uh, you know how how we do as a team now to me it would make it's ridiculous to break that team up and from a situational point of view the um, the keeping of it together to to you know to keep that team going seems to me a much more sensible way forward um, I mean I, it's not a metaphor I'm 100% com com comfortable with because I think too many politicians emphasize competitiveness and and emphasize too much that that we need to compete in a global market and so on I'm not 100% comfortable with the concept of constant competition to compete comes from the old English uh, old Latin phrase which means to petition or to pray together uh, a competition or uh, was 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 praying together actually so I think there's an element of of spiritual solidarity that underlies competition and so my argument for keeping the UK is not so much about well we can compete better in world markets together although I think that's true but because I think we can be a better influence for the good by solving our problems and then sharing those solutions with other countries I think we have a duty having founded the Commonwealth or the British Empire having founded these wonderful countries around the world like Australia and Canada and New Zealand and and all of the others South Africa and so on having played a role in constitution building and and law giving and so on I think we should stay together and help bring into being a peaceful global community we need to go out there and solve and 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 and, and you know help countries solve their civil wars and their conflicts whether it's Libya or Iraq or Afghanistan or Israel Palestine and and show that it's possible as we solve the problems of Northern Ireland I think we have the makings of a possible peace witness to the rest of the planet and it's not surprising that um, George Fox one of the greatest Christian peace activists came from Britain came from Derbyshire I've, I've for many years been involved with the Quakers on and off and I regard myself as a kind of maverick Quaker I'm still registered as an attender at Hampstead Friends Meeting House in London and from a Quaker perspective I think keeping the whole country together but but somehow getting it back on track so that it's fulfilling its mission as a child of of God rather than you know a sort of commercial competitive um, violent warmongering nation is I think where situation ethics would come in Joseph Fletcher also <coughs> argues that the key thing to ask in any situation is where what would agape say of this choice where does divine love agape come in what is the most loving thing to do and I would say that staying together is the most loving thing because for all our warts and discomforts with one another the people of these islands I think do love each other 
and this is proved by the countless intermarriages between Scots and English and Welsh and Irish over the centuries. You know, we are literally one people. I'm part Irish, part, you know, Welsh and, and Scottish and so on, a mixture like everyone else. And if you go back in time, you know, we all have these layers. I mean, I have Norman ancestry and, you know, we're all a mixture. And, and that surely is what love is about. It's about mixture. If you look at the structure of the DNA, we're all mixed up with these incredibly complex streams of DNA. We're all interconnected. Isn't that what love is? Um, you know, um, surely that's, that's the symbol, why they call it the tree of life. Some people argue that the tree of life metaphor in the Kabbalah goes back to this instinct about DNA structure and so on. There is this interconnectedness that underlies everything. So I think if you make a choice that stands for interconnectedness, that stands for togetherness, harmony, brotherhood, sisterhood, then you're ultimately saying, yes, I want, I want to choose love rather than separation. And what happens to DNA under nuclear radiation is that it breaks up. That's why you get mutations that lead to uh, you know, people with tremendous illnesses and so on. We're facing this threat of fusion and destruction from our world, it, we have to somehow find the power of love that can that can be so strong that it will out you know out see the the tendencies towards fission and separation. Another school of ethics talks about consequentialism. It's not it's it's not so much the rule that governs your choice; it's the outcomes that that um, one should look for. And from the perspective of consequentialism, I think, again, the, the impact of a separation in the United Kingdom would, would be so, well, difficult to predict. But from all the, um, you know, the, the studies that have come in, all the academic studies, the economic studies, and so on, the consequences would actually potentially be quite large. And I think, therefore, we have a responsibility to, to, to keep our country together, and, and be aware of those consequences and make sure that we don't create conditions which could lead us to becoming a kind of the new Yugoslavia story, the new balkanization. It would be a horrendous outcome and I'm personally not prepared to participate in, in a silencing of, of one's duty to point this out. So consequentialism, I think, would argue that, yes, you know, it's far safer to keep with this model that we've developed over 400 years of, of a united kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and yet perfect it, bring it to fruition, actually de deliver on the ideals that we're supposed to espouse as a country. And that doesn't mean going along with, with the latest <coughs> neo-secular political correctness. What it means is reaching deeply into our hearts and souls and finding what this country is really about at its core. And I believe it's about peace. It's about showing the possibility of, of multiculturalism. It's about tolerance and it's about harmony. So that's what I think we should be doing.